Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will be joined by Kelly to discuss self-service reporting and data prep benefits and risks sponsored today by Dremio. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of the screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you the series speaker, the speaker of the series, let me just, uh, Donna Purbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the Managing Director of Global Data Strategies Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked in, with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences. And joining Donna today is Kelly Sturman, the CMO and VP of Strategy at Dremio, a data-as-a-service platform company. Over the last 14 years, Kelly has served in multiple senior roles in various companies such as MongoDB, HeadApt, and MarkLogic. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to join these and see familiar voice of names on the attendee list, so thanks to those who join fairly regularly. Um, this particular uh, webinar, and we'll talk more about it, will be particularly interactive. One of the great things about Dataversity Crowd is that you guys are always asking great questions, and because this is more of a panel style, we'll be opening up for you for Q&A. For those of you who like to take your Q&A and discussions out on Twitter, there is a hashtag, uh, hashtag DA Strategies, uh, for this event, and we'll be looking at that as well. Um, and I'm on uh, Twitter at Donna Burbank if you want to. DM me or anything. I will not get to it until after the webinar because I am terrible at, at multitasking. But um, with this, will be more interactive. The other question that comes up, as you know, this is a series where we talk about all various and sundry topics that relate to data architecture, and this is the last this year. But if you're not, uh, they are all on demand, and that's often a question we get. But Dataversity keeps all of these in the archives um, forever, as long as I know. Um, so you can catch any of these other topics that you may have missed uh, earlier in the year. Um, Next year, we are lining up already a good a lineup of, of topics. We hope you can join us as well. Coming in January, we'll be talking, and this has been a bit of a tradition for us, kind of what's the, what are the new trends to be thinking of in the coming year, and what's kind of the next big thing, and what you should be paying attention to. So today, which is why you joined, <laughs> the topic is more on self-service reporting and data preparation, uh, and we list those two together. So we are all data professionals on this call, and we realize that reporting doesn't come without good prep, right? And this is a hot topic. Most of my customers that I work with are either doing some sort of self-service data prep or asking the question of is it right for them, and, and how do we get there? It isn't all about tools and technology. That's a big part of it, and that's part of the driver. Um, but uh, the other big part of it is how do you have the right architecture supporting those tools, and how do you get the governance uh, across different roles and different stakeholders across. So before we jump in, we have a quick poll question for you, just to, to get a, a feel of the audience today. Uh, the, the poll is, are you currently implementing self-service? So yes, you are. You're, it's running. You're in place. Yes, the middle one is, but we're just beginning to investigate, or we just started, so I can't really say a full yes. Um, or no, we don't have one in place. So those are your three options. I will give it Shannon the floor to open up the official polls. So over on your right, you should see whether we do or not have a self-service strategy. It's going to, after you hit submit, it'll take a little time for the polls to open, and then we will share you with share with you what everybody else has been saying as well. So hopefully you will be curious. And if you don't participate, then you will not be part of the voice of the crowds. So I encourage you to hit the little button whether you're doing self-service or not. Okay, it looks like the poll has been submitted and it is going through the staging area and sent to a star schema to be reported shortly, so we will get the results. There's always some latency. This is why Shannon tells me not to do these, but I never listen, so it's always a little bit of a lag before we get them. All right, 
Shanna, should we be seeing the results, or am I missing something? Dr. Shannon on. All right. Well, I did not see the answer of our own poll. Um, Shannon? We will skip this awkward moment, and we will go on to the discussion, and if we can get the, the answer later, we will. All right, so um, maybe that will be our little uh, our excitement at the end. Um, I mean, what are some of the drivers going towards self-service data prep, right? And this shouldn't be a surprise that a lot of it is just shorter time to insight, right? There's so much information we we want to get. There's so many different, more types of information. Everybody wants to be a data-driven company, right? Um, so that is the goal. Um, so how we just don't have enough people to do that. So we want to become a data-driven. We want to react the time to have business con conditions and have operational efficiencies, right? So I, I think this is not a surprise. That is the drive for we want more analytics, we want more reporting. Um, traditionally, your sources are sort of the traditional ones, right? Uh, when we do a lot of the surveys, uh, still things are in relational databases. Data Warehouse makes spreadsheets, unfortunately, are one of the more popular um, databases out there. Um, I have to put that in air quotes, right? Um, but that makes it a little easier. And, and in the past, even though things were sort of in the relational world, I, you know, not this doesn't happen and there isn't a place for this, but it was sort of a, a business person would, would need a query that sort of throw it over to the wall. They would send it over to the data warehouse team that was already very busy because they're trying to report up to, to management, and there was this, this lag. Um, and that wasn't really fun or isn't fun if you're still doing some of this for either side, because the data where there is just not enough people on the planet to be, the, to the way people think is more exploratory, right? I have an idea. I have an idea now, and I want to see. <laughs> I'm going to build a marketing campaign. I, I want to see what the results are, what, what regions. I, should, I, can't, I can't wait a few weeks for the, for the data warehouse the team to get back to me. Data warehouse team is busy with some very important reports, can't respond to every version of slicing and dicing. So there has to be some sort of... Uh, self-service capability, whether, you know, there obviously there's some prep involved. Is there one data warehouse that everybody sends information to, or are there marts, or are there more just lakes or hubs or whatever you want to call it? So this is this is the problem we're a bit, so, I mean, not, not that either size of these go away, right? You need both, but how do we break down that wall and have that work correctly? What sort of compounds the problem or opportunity, I like to think, but it just makes our reporting environment more complex is that everything does not live in a nice, clean, relational database that is in a warehouse. If that were the case, I think self-service would be a bit easier. Um, so you'll just look here. Although relational databases still are the leading, whether it's on-prem or on the cloud, and I oh, can't get rid of those spreadsheets, right? Um, you'll see just the, the breadth of the different platforms we have. And this was a survey we had done with Dataversity earlier, I guess, in last year. Um, but when we ask into the future, you'll see that those bars are even more dispersed, that it is, you know, clearly relational databases stay, more are in the cloud, but people are looking at a lot of different platforms, real time, Internet of Things, you know, big data platforms, streaming, um, and a lot of people don't know, and, and because they don't know, because things are changing so drastically. So I think not only is it just the, the volume and the timing of getting those reports, there's just a lot of different platforms. So. One of the, the discussions we have, and I'm going to open up to Kelly in a minute, um, who's our guest speaker, but I, I kind of, if folks who want to be taking active use of the chat, please do, because we'll kind of open it up and take your questions throughout. We won't do the, your typical take questions at the end. Um, we're going to kind of open it up throughout, so it's more of a, a collaborative. Um, so, Kelly, I want to get, you know, you are in the, you've been in this business for a long time with your pedigree. I, I kind of want to get your thought of how, is this expansion of the data sources beyond relational? Is that complicating self-service reporting? Is it workable? Is it exciting? And, and how does someone tool up in this new world? What skills are needed? What are your thoughts here? It's a good question. I think, <clears throat> um, to be clear, I think overwhelmingly, uh, if you look at the data that is of interest and valuable to companies, it is still uh, dominated by relational databases. But newer strategic applications um, and where there's maybe interesting new types of data that might be relatively small compared to just, you know, decades of accumulated data in relational systems, those tend to be in non-relational sources 
that might be um, a data lake, it might be something like S3 on AWS or ADLS on Azure that are simply, you know, much closer to something like a file system than a relational database. Right. And the underlying data tends to be modeled and structured in something called JSON. And this does complicate things in terms of self-service because um, those data structures are fundamentally incompatible with the sorts of tools that people are already using today. <clears throat> so if you take something like your favorite BI tool and try and point it at these new sources of data, you're, you're sort of stuck because you can't simply, you know, point with an ODBC driver to those sources and start to go to work the way you're used to with something like SQL Server or Oracle. Um, and so I think that does pose some, some interesting challenges and what, what you end up is sort of going backwards in time to the, to the point when you didn't have self-service and you ask, hey, IT, can you get this data ready for me uh, or can you build a report for me because I can't really do it myself with the tools that, that I'm used to using. So, I mean, what, what is their hope? Does everyone now need to be this, well, I love to say, it, the sexiest job of the 21st century, according to Harvard Business, the, this idea of the data scientist? Do you, do you think it's feasible for business people to sort of learn JSON? And, or do you think that's a place where there's that partnership between IT and more business-focused people? Well, I, I think, um, I, I don't think it's feasible for every BI user to become a data scientist. Um, I think, you know, some of them can and, and have made that transition but I don't think it's necessary either. Um, we, we at Dremio, uh, we see this as an opportunity for a new class of technology that we call data as a service. Because the same way that, you know, software engineers love AWS because instead of waiting on IT to rack and stack servers, they can click a button just like shopping on Amazon and get, you know, infrastructure on demand. Um, we think there's a similar opportunity for data and so for people that are used to using self-service reporting and visualization and data prep tools, we think there's a similar kind of experience opportunity in terms of getting to the data itself. Um, and that is what our product is focused on, is making it so you don't have to be dependent on IT, so that you can go into uh, a data as a service platform, do a Google search to find a data set, inspect it visually, and then click a button to launch your favorite tool and go to work. And it doesn't matter if the data is in JSON, it doesn't matter if it's an Excel spreadsheet or a relational database or some other format, you don't have to worry about that because the data you need is at your fingertips on demand and Dremio takes care of the heavy lifting in the background to make that possible. Yeah. Another point you brought up I think is a good one because when we talk about data, we so often think of you know, the database or the JSON files or you know, the XML that's being passed across. But the other big excitement in the industry is this idea of the cloud technology and the scalability. And again, this is from the uh, data diversity survey we had done last year. And you'll just see that the you know overwhelming number of people are you know starting to implement a cloud strategy or planning to, because as you mentioned, it's so easy to spin up some of these you know uh, AWS and some of the, the different um, platforms. It can help with scalability. It can help with cost. Um, it's also obviously not without its risks, and I think that some people are you know, rightly concerned about things like security and privacy, but also skills was another big slice of that pie. And, and I'd like your thoughts, because I'm glad you brought that up, of how does that help self -share? We're so used to, that almost seemed, if we, you know, we're dividing up roles, okay, IT you know, does the provisioning, they get the platform set up, and then we, we BI or we self-service BI, we can do the queries on the data. But do you think even that's changing, that now maybe a more traditional you know, business person could spin up their own servers as well? I, I think that um, the way that you should think about this and attendees should think about this is um, that increasingly the experience you will have as an employee at a company is that instead of um, double clicking on an icon on your desktop to launch a desktop tool to do these tasks, you will uh, log in through your browser to a cloud-based version of the same software where you no longer have to worry about upgrades on your desktop, uh, you no longer have to worry about, you know, some kind of incompatibility with the tool and the way your particular desktop is configured. Instead, it will be like using any other browser-based service where somebody else in the background is taking care of all of that complexity 
and you get access to these services um, in a very simple, clean way. And so instead of you thinking about, oh, I'm going to go to AWS or I'm going to go to Azure and spin up infrastructure, instead you will log into a data prep capability in the cloud or you will log into a BI capability in the cloud and have everything that you're used to having, but it, it will be managed in the background for you seamlessly. The real opportunity here for companies as they transition to cloud, I think, is that employees don't know about it, that um, what you're really doing is, is taking away the, the infrastructure area of complexity. And in the same sense that today as an employee, you don't really think about servers running in a data center, uh, or hopefully you don't have to, that um, you know, one day when you deploy some kind of workload, it just happens to be running in the cloud instead of the data center of your company. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting distinction is that, you know, we do, we sort of get set in our own patterns, but really having it be a whole ecosystem and not even thinking of I'm doing the platform and then I'm moving it across um, and getting the BI layer on top. It's an interesting uh, perspective. Um, our audience has been a bit uh, quieter than normal, so I'm just wondering, I want to throw that out to the attendees. Is anybody here successfully implementing the, what we've described, um, this idea of using cloud for more self-service and um, having more business people kind of either do all of the above that we've mentioned um, or maybe having IT do some of the provisioning and doing more of the reporting side? I'll give a little pause there, and again, if you haven't found the chat button, that's a great way to kind of type in your response. I am switching phones here. And my own technical difficulties. I mean, I found it with some of my own clients um, that this is a bit of, and I find it myself. I think we, with a lot of us who have been in the business for so long, we kind of get our old patterns um, and just sort of think, oh, well, I got to spin up the server, or I have to, uh, you know, uh, do some of these old-fashioned things that we haven't had to in the past. Um, so that's a different way of, of kind of looking at it. Um, I know there's also some risks. I think thinking of um, thinking of some of these web platforms like it were a regular desktop server. I had one client that was just thinking of it sort of like SQL Server, and they were sort of spinning up all of these cloud platforms and forgot that it was subscription-based and had a ridiculous with a lot of zeros bill at the end of the day. <laughs> so um, a, a lot of different paradigms to be thinking of. Um, and I think we had an issue with WebEx, and I'm wondering if we're all still on. Well, I'm still here, and I can hear you loud and clear if that helps. Um, great. Do we still have Shannon? And can you view the slides? I can see the slides. All right. Um, it is one of those days. Um, all right. Um, great. So I'm going to move on into the discussion. Sorry for the technical difficulties we're having today. I see one question in the chat. If you if you okay, want to. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, if you want to take that, that would be great. Yeah. So the question is, um, uh, how do we sell, or how do you sell the cloud to highly secure, conscious organizations? Yeah. Do you want to take your first shot at that one? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I talk to tier one banks, government agencies, you know, Fortune 10 manufacturers, healthcare providers. Um, the, the, the topic of security, I think, has made a significant um, turn in terms of what people's expectations are. And I, and I think now, by and large, companies believe that cloud providers are better at enabling security than individual organizations are on their own. If you talk to Gartner, if you talk to Forrester, or many industry analysts, um, that has become prevailing wisdom among folks. And if you if you look at just the frequency of data breaches, uh, we just you know we just had one with uh, SPG. My, you know my data is out there via SPG, um, affecting you know three or four hundred million people. Uh, and those happen with, with regular frequency, I think companies have become more comfortable with um, relying on the cloud providers to implement security on their behalf more effectively than they can do so themselves. Yeah, no, I think, 
I, I think every, a lot of folks are looking for that silver bullet, and having it in-house isn't necessarily more secure if you're not securing it, right? <laughs> That's a very good point you just brought up. Well, so, you have locks on your cars yeah. and, your, and your house. If you don't lock them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah. That somebody's going to go charging right in, and I think that's what happens in a lot of companies is people forget to lock the doors. Yeah, and another similar comment um, that I see is that uh, similar to the one I mentioned on this cloud, the cost implications of cloud versus data center. Um, so I think people said that that is sort of why IT spins up the platforms in that they are sort of in control of that budget. And and to me that's similar to what we were just saying about security in that. Yeah, there's no necessarily right or wrong answer, but there is implications, right? So someone has the budget, and so you you don't want to willy-nilly do either one of these. <laughs> Did you have thoughts, Kelly, on the kind of cost side of that? Because it's come up a couple times now. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I, I firsthand have made that mistake where I accidentally left a uh, fleet of servers running over a weekend only to discover about a $50,000 bill on Monday morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Unfortunately, we were able to talk to uh, the cloud provider and, and you know, plea uh, ignorance and, and cut a deal. But um, they, they don't make it, uh, they're not incented to automatically terminate instances, but now there are lots of services that let you um, make it so that, you know, things automatically turn off if you forget, if you forget and leave them on, um, or that you, you're issued alerts when you pass certain price thresholds. Uh, so, so there's a lot better offerings through all three of the cloud providers in terms of helping you understand ongoing costs, but it is a risk. Um, it's cheap to get started, but the cost can certainly add up. You, you ultimately pay for that flexibility and convenience that the cloud product providers offer. Um, it's up to you as a customer to make sure the costs don't get out of control. Yeah, and, and I, I think um, we'll talk a lot more about governance, and I think that is a key part of governance is, you know, whether it's security, whether it's cost, somebody needs to take ownership. And when we talk about, you know, is it IT or is it the business, we have to be very clear on those roles. And I think that's something we'll talk a lot more about. Um, another comment that came up is this idea of the semantic layer, and I'm glad this came up because we're big fans of that, and we will talk more about that as well also. Um, but data just doesn't magically query itself, right? So having that semantic layer and kind of the, the business and technical definitions. Um, I'm assuming you'll agree there, Kelly. I know that's near and dear to your heart. Oh, absolutely, yeah. That, that's, um, how many times have you looked at a data set and you know the name of a column was C03 um, or something meaningless like that? I think different teams have a different sense of what the meaning of the data is and how they want to describe the data, um, tracking ownership, uh, who to call if you have a question, understanding how often it's updated, um, how it's related to other data sets, what reports are based on a particular data set. There's just so much tribal knowledge floating around and it's really not captured effectively anywhere in most companies. Um, and if it is captured somewhere, it, it tends to be in a particular tool, like one particular BI tool, where it can't be used by other teams who are using a different BI tool or, uh, or, or other, other technologies. So the, the concept, I think, is incredibly important, and everyone ends up doing it somehow. Um, just not as efficiently and uh, universally as they would like to. Yeah, I think those are uh, those comments, and there's a lot more comments in the, around something similar. Is this idea of that the roles involved, right? So it it is just like we saw the database platforms being so diverse. I think the number of people looking at the data, which is of course data architects are doing architecture, but when you look at whether it's DBAs, programs, business people. This idea of getting the roles right and, and being collaborative where it makes sense, but also I think we're coming up with some ideas of where in some cases we do need to have more strict ownership. Somebody's paying the bill, right? So who owns that? Um, and who owns the architecture? So, um, uh, sorry, it is a, a day. Um, yeah, one of the ta tactics that I, I'm seeing increasingly from companies is this idea of crowdsourcing the the semantic layer that instead of it being you know a, a big IT project that 
that lasts for months and months, and then it completes, and then that's sort of a static sense of what the, the data assets are and the semantic description of those assets. Instead, providing capabilities um, uh, through things like data catalogs that allow teams to, um, to describe, almost like a wiki, to describe what the data is and to keep that up to date based on the ongoing evolution of, of the business and the teams and people working with the data. Um, and making that really a crowdsourced thing instead of something that, that only IT can develop and maintain for business users. Yeah, I think that idea of crowdsourcing is so critical. And I, I wanted to sort of kind of get to the next question before we go to some of the other additional comments, because I, I think this idea is, is a new paradigm, right, of this self-service user. And, and it, I think it's a mix of self-service data prep tools that we've been talking so much about, this idea of crowdsourcing. But there's also a place for, you know, it doesn't mean that data warehouses go away or that master data systems go away, right, um, or glossaries and data models and all the semantic layer. But I think there's a balance between this idea of crowdsourcing and Wikipedia and then some of this more encyclopedia, right? In some cases, the financial data we're reporting to the street, that, that is locked down, and there's certain definitions that we do need. So um, and where do you kind of see that balance? And again, is this a place where you think tools help? Is it a governance model, all of the above? Kelly, what's your kind of thoughts on that? I, in a way, I think all of the above. I think um, the certainly tools help, but a lot of it is really about the culture of the organization. Um, are people uh, okay with the sort of the truth about the data being something that the business is owning and maintaining? Um, are they empowered to own and maintain that? Um, uh, or is, is the culture such that no one wants to step up for that and they want it to be something that IT is responsible for? Um, I mean, companies vary in, in how, uh, how they want to balance those responsibilities. Um, and, and I think tools open up the door to, to a possibility where ownership can, can rest in, in, that, in the hands of the business, but just because the tool's there doesn't mean that it's going to be effectively applied in that organization. There has to be a cultural, uh, a cultural aspect to embracing that change that, um, that has strong uh, empowerment from leadership to, to make that reality possible. Yeah, this one I'm sure will generate a lot of discussion. It already has, and I'll kind of throw out two of the comments. So Sharisha mentioned earlier um, this idea that IT provides sort of a layer of abstraction um, to, to augment the self-service BI, right? So whether it's OLAP or a relational view or a Power BI data set, et cetera. Um, and I think from the tool perspective, that makes sense. Um, but then Gail chimed in and said, but isn't data owned by the business? And I think they're both right in a way, right? So this idea of having this idea of data stewardship or data custodians, and it's what I spend a lot of my practice doing, of trying to get that balance right, of you're right, but I think uh, the business owns the data definitions, but IT typically has had kind of the, the, their fingers on the tools. I'm going to pause a bit because I know people will have uh, some discussions on this on chat. How, how are people getting that balance right? Is it the business people that are providing the business definitions? Is it a governance committee that works together and then IT types them in? Uh, what, what's sort of working in other people's uh, companies here? Oh, you guys are going to get shy. I have seen in my practice, and this is a, a way I think some of the tools have evolved a lot. Um, so I think in some of the, I don't want to say old-fashioned, because in some ways there, there is that place for the encyclopedia approach, um, where maybe there is a, a group that vets certain definitions, and this is how we define total sales or customer, et cetera. But I think the real world is, as we're doing self-service data prep, there's this idea of collaboration. And as I'm using a data set, I might find out that, oh, Europe is using a different definition for total sales. And all are right. I think you need both. There's some place where we have the, the committee locking things down, but you need that, that discussion that kind of comes through as well. Um, uh, Gail mentioned that she has sort of a data steward team. Um, uh, with a mixed level of engagement, that's it. Sometimes, sometimes it takes a few examples to get people excited for why they need metadata, right? And I think my favorite 
insert company here. It happens almost all the time. If, if you're just a lonely IT voice saying, but guys, the data quality is bad. It's bad. Guys, the data quality is bad. We need a definition. Because they, until they get to self-service, and they'll say, guys, the data quality is bad. We need a definition, right? So I think that's a way where self-service has sort of helped governance come into play because people are seeing the data um, uh, firsthand. And, and I think that's a place where um, – there is some some overlap. Uh, Peter Lamb mentioned that his organization is just beginning that journey of having the business 100% own the definitions rather than IT. Um, yeah, I'd be curious how that journey is going because I think that is the, the the evolution, right? Because data data is that weird thing that it's an IT thing, but it's also it's used by the business, right? So a lot more folks are kind of chiming in. James mentioned that his his enterprise business owns and defines the data. Um, uh, Roger mentions that this is probably a good distinction. The business owns the glossary, where IT handles the data dictionary. Um, Kelly, I might pass that back to you. Do, you. do you kind of see maybe that's a good def, you know, kind of split between a glossary versus a dictionary? Or do you think with self-service, there's kind of an overlap there as well? Yeah, and I think it's probably worth trying to, um, to explain exactly what those terms mean, because glossary and dictionary sound like synonyms. But I think what uh, Roger means is that, you know, for example, um, the, the valid values for a particular field, uh, this is a trivial example, but say states in the United States, that those are controlled by, um, by IT and, you know, a, 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 you know, Joe user can't go in and add a state to the list of states, right? That's a, that's a dictionary question. The glossary is um, the, the meaning of this column called ST is actually state, and that means states in the United States of America. And we use this in the systems A, B, and C and for reports one, two, and three. I think that's the distinction between the dictionary and the glossary. Oh, and I, I think that's a, a, that's a nice balance. Yeah, no, but I bet we'll get a lot of discussion on that because I might slightly differ from that. I think, well, to me, and this, <laughs> as an industry that defines terms for a living, I think we're horrible at defining terms. To me, a data dictionary, and maybe it's just a subtlety on yours, is, is more, that's my data structures, right? I have a table with column A, B, C. This is maybe the, the de technical definition of how you query it. A glossary may have some of the similar terms, like you mentioned, with, with a state code, or maybe that's reference data, but what is even a customer? <laughs> is there a customer different than a process? Aspect, or how do we define total sales? Or, um, you know, I, I think there's business terms. Or I know I'm, one of the first things I do when I go to an organization, what do all these acronyms mean? You know, what's HIPAA if I'm in healthcare and I don't know what HIPAA is, right? Yeah. So I, I, that's often a question I have from people. What is that fine line between a data dictionary? Is that more technical and a glossary is only business terms? Is there an overlap? Um, you know, I think, I think there's probably a continuum, especially as some of the data is more exposed directly to the business. Um, any other thoughts there on using data dictionaries or data? I thought to be more, am I the only one that's passionate about that one? Now there's a first. <laughs> um, I do think, how many people on, um, okay, so Gail sort of <laughs> timed in that um, when we're talking about a prospect, you know, sales only wanted sort of a first name mandatory. And you know, before That's I end, great. yeah, the the we have a lot of interest from John. John keeps raising his hand every week. He's interested in our products. Um, it's it's hard if that's the only mandatory field. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Um, but, you know, that's a balance, and that's where I think this business and IT can um, – I, I worked with a large retail company, and they, there was a whole data governance committee on that because I can see the salesperson's point of view of, you know, I, I have this person there, lead, they're interested. I don't want to log them down with what's your name, what's your address, what's your propensity to buy, and all of that. But once they realize to your very point, we can't do much with John um, if we want to have a marketing campaign for John. Um, that doesn't help. And, and I think as we start doing more of that collaborating, to me, it, as business and IT start to work closely together, I think some of these walls that we showed in the beginning start to break down because people start to understand the why, why data is being used. Why do I have to get an email from a customer? Well, because if you want them to get a sales campaign, <laughs> that's how you, and I think often that's where some of the data quality starts to improve. Um, Make sure we catch everything. So Peter, again, was talking about some of the naming standards. And again, I think that is 
kind of what we were talking about again is sometimes that's a struggle of you want to have standards, but you you also want to have some freedom of, of query. So uh, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, passing that back to you, Kelly. What what do you think the balance is of how much should be locked down in terms of naming standards and data type standards and how much should be kind of opened up with the business? Well, I think there there needs to be the flexibility for uh, a, you know, a canonical way to name and describe uh, data uh, that is effectively owned by IT. But I think that the idea that everyone is going to use one way to describe their data, just it just doesn't work in practice. If you look at, you know, marketing's, uh, marketing's relationship with a data set about customers versus sales versus finance, you know, those three groups of, uh, of people have different needs for the same data and different ways they think about it and different ways that it might make sense for them to describe it. And so this, this idea of a crowdsourced way of describing and maybe even, you know, preparing and manipulating data for different sorts of work, I think that needs to be something that companies embrace, that um, they need the data itself to be you know, central and one copy and it's vetted and the integrity is ensured and I IT is ultimately responsible for the data itself, but, but different people have different needs for the data and they'll kind of one size fits all. I just don't see that working very well in practice. And if companies don't embrace that, what happens? Well, people copy the data into spreadsheets and they start to do whatever they want with it and then it leaves the governed environment that, that IT worked so hard to create in the first place, and you end up with teams reaching different conclusions about the same data. So I think there needs to be a way for the data to be in you know, one copy that is centrally governed, but that different people can use it and describe it in different ways. I think, yeah, and I think that's a great way of kind of adding context to this picture here where we had that idea of the encyclopedia and, and Wikipedia. Um, and kind of the way I look at it too, I, and I think we agree, is that you know, there, and some things I think there are, and I have a, another slide, it's famous, I have a slide for everything, but um, you know, almost the more data is shared, you know, that common subset of, of core, maybe master data, that should be locked down, there should be a canonical way. Let's not argue and have everyone have a different version of how we're storing first name. You know, if a first name needs to be longer, we'll all agree, we'll make it longer, make it work for everybody. I think there's a place for that core set bed of truth, because that's where I see a lot of just the spinning of, you know, are we spending all of our time cleaning up addresses when we could just have that right? But I think you're right, and when we get into this idea of self-service, that idea of what's the right definition of total sales. There isn't, there, there may be the one we send to the street, there may be the one that finance uses internally, there may be the one, as long as you put that context, which is part of that Wikipedia dynamic approach. I think that is that we got metadata on read, you know, I guess kind of like we have schema on read. You know, yeah. as long as that core core is defined, we're not worrying about just spinning on that. There's a, a valid reason why it depends. And as long as we have the query I have some clients that actually store the query that we use this definition in to kind of give that context. In this report, this is the the calculation we're using and there's a reason for it. <laughs> I think that gets rid of all of the spinning. Yeah, we have um, a similar approach. Yeah. Um in, in, in Dremio that as people provision data sets for particular needs, the, the query that defines that data set, any applicable transformations, the description of what that data set's purpose is and who it's for, and the security controls that go along with that, that's all part of the context for the data set that's provisioned for a particular user. And, and we, we do that virtually without making copies of the data, which is kind of a core tenant of, of the product. You don't need Dremio to do that necessarily. We, we kind of make it easier. But that idea of everything has context, and you need to be able to capture that context to, to preserve kind of the, the, the custody and the, the information about why that data made sense for that particular user at that time. I think that's incredibly important. I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, I think that, and I think that's what I think a lot of light bulbs are coming as we move into this self-service data prep. It is a changing world. I think Gail um, chimed in. Does anyone else have difficulties with one part of IT eliciting business requirements without considering other areas of the business requirements? And I think 
that's almost a, a symptom of, of what we've just discussed. I think for some, you know, for some, if we have core shared data, it has to be a short core shared decision, or we open it up and let individual groups to define their own, as long as that's open and people can see it. And I think some of these tools you mentioned, Kelly, are a way. IT doesn't have time to talk to everybody, and sometimes you find some hidden secrets in an area. Of, I had one customer that they had a query. Someone down the hallway was using a very similar query, and they said, I didn't know that was all being calculated. And they were down the hall from each other and didn't know that until they were looking on this sort of crowdsourced you know, data catalog. And so I, I think that's a way to get more voices into the conversation that you might not have seen, heard before. You know? It's a way of – sometimes technology is a way to bring people together, which is sort of ironic. You know? It's not replacing people. It's actually helping that conversation. Donna, I know that you had um, other, other slides. I don't know if you – like. Uh, what you're seeing on your end, but your what we see is still a slide like uh, the one of the polling questions from a while back. Um, slide 14 is what we're seeing. Okay, we are having. I am now. Now it's jumping again. So we should. Oh, it looks be on like the I can move your slides. Would you like me to move your slides for you? <laughs> what slide would you like to go to? <laughs> um, I think we're both moving. So it should be on uh, 18. I'm not sure why we're having these difficulties. Um, a little bit more from the audience, perhaps, on this idea of the, the crowdsourcing of metadata. Are people trying that? Any, any curmudgeons on the call that think we're naive um, and think that there, there do need to be um, kind of more rules and strictness or, or someone that maybe tried this collaboration and kind of thought it went too, too far the other way? Because I know a lot of this is a continuum, and we're still sort of kind of fleshing that out. I had one example, and, and this t it, this is the I think the, um, the 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 minority and not the majority. But in, in some case, I think you want to pick what can be open source defined. I think when there's a core de decision of of what we mean by customer and prospect, and whether social security numbers should be obfuscated, and we're talking about PII or social security number, you know, I think those they shouldn't be defined. Uh, there was one of those core decisions. And there were two team members that did not agree. One was in Asia and one was in the U.S. And uh, the, the person in the U.S. had her definition and she would change it. And then overnight in Asia, the other person would override it. And they were not <laughs> – there was a better way to resolve that conflict because they were not going to agree. And finally, we did that with a place where I think the old-fashioned, old you know, the more human touch steering committee came in and said, okay, we need to sort of agree on this. And that was – one way crowdsourcing went bad, <laughs> I think – most often, that's why I think there's that balance of the encyclopedia um, and then the, the sort of Wikipedia approach. Um, any other thoughts on that that you had, Kelly, or do you think that used to be working well for you? Well, I, I mean, see, I see different things at different companies. Um, and I guess from, from my perspective is the, the, the crowdsourcing uh, is happening whether you want it to or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The question is, are you are you providing a way to capture it so people can collaborate and benefit from each other's work uh, and communicate more effectively, or are you letting these things sort of happen on, you know, sp spreadsheets and email chains? Um, and and I think Peter, you know, uh, Peter just said that the reason we're standing up a crowdsource glossary is because previously there was no single source of truth for the business to refer to, to besides the CDM. The CDM is a very large and academic model, but it provided no use to the business because only IT knew how to navigate through the artifact. I've seen that so many times, and it's probably not up to date either um, because things change, and new data flows in, and new use cases pop up, and people need a way to stay on top of that. Um, and it's not going to happen from IT, I don't think, because like, let's face it, if you think about our experience with IT for most people, is it's like going to you know, the world's most popular deli, and you go take a number and wait in line. And for every, you know, for every 100 people that are what we call data consumers, users of BI tools, data science, people who rely on data, there's one, on, on average in most companies, for every 100 data consumers, there's one person in, in IT who is tasked with supporting their needs. And so we end up waiting in line a long time. So you have to take some of this work and put it back into the hands of the, the data consumers so they can do their jobs effectively. And I think this is a great example of something that, that most users can do very effectively. Um, it's in their best interest and it's something that they want to do. So yeah, let's get out I, of their way and let them do it. Yeah, no, that's good. I think that's, I, I liked your comment because I think it's a bit of, of truth when, you know, we, when we used to lock it down, 
people did, worked around us in the past anyway, right? So you could say this is the definition, and then people said, yeah, yeah, and did their own thing on a spreadsheet, right? So that's not ideal. I think there is a balance, and I think um, – um, one of the comments was, as long as we're clear of, I think it was Joe that mentioned what metadata is curated and what is not. I think that's key back to that encyclopedia. You know, this is our our definition. We're going to the street. This is the, I, you know, this is the curated definition of what a customer means. I think some of these core artifacts. When we're talking about master data or a corporate data warehouse. I think almost having, you know, if you think of Twitter, the kind of the verified users type of thing. I think being clear on what is curated, what has been mastered what has had all that hard work behind it versus this is how I wrote a query against it. I think that's kind of the best of both worlds. Is I think the old way doesn't go away. I think it's broadened you know, from my point of view because I think you're right. You can't lock down everything. No one, I think that's the last thing IT wants to do as well. So I think it's the idea of focusing on that piece that needs to be curated and then opening up everything else and then providing that. I think a data scientist would love a curated data set of customers, right? If it's there, they'll certainly use it. Um, I, I will, I will I question you a bit on the, the CDM or the conceptual data model. I, I think um, you, you call my baby ugly. I think, uh, no, I think it was it a bad CDM because I find a conceptual data model very different from a glossary. It sort of has a different um, use and, and a different way of visually showing the information. I've often found that to be an excellent tool to use in addition to a glossary, in addition to a data dictionary, but a way to kind of show the relationships to data. You know, some of these arguments of is it a prospect or a customer or a, you know, a lead, sometimes just showing a visual picture can be the right way to do it. So I think with any technology we can say we had one that didn't work, um, but I think CDM is a tried and true way of really showing things in a, and often that feeds your glossary, right? It's, that's that's the battling out of with the customer versus the prospect, and then that cleans definition can go into the uh, glossary. And I've had sometimes CDMs published next to the glossary. So I think it's an and, and not necessarily an or. Great. Well, I think that's been some great discussion. Um, uh, there's someone that says their business people didn't know the value of the CDM or it they see it and it tells them things they didn't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think sometimes spelling it out on a model sometimes shows some of these. This is why we're trying to say there's a difference between, you know, a product and a component or a finished product and a raw material, you know, some of these things that are core to the business. And I have found that's an often way we can get kind of buy-in with the business. So they sort of understand maybe why the model didn't work or why the analytics weren't right. Some of these core dec decisions weren't, weren't there. Um, there's Great. a good question here that we didn't talk about. Oh, um, sure. It's set from from David that says, "I think it needs to be curated by whom?" And, I, and by it, I think he means anything the, the glossary, the dictionary, whatever it is. If we have crowdsource, that means you can have potentially garbage, um, right? That any anybody puts in there. So the notion of vetting the information or curating the information, I think, is really important. And there's a role that we've started to see emerging companies that, that many folks call data stewards who, or data curators uh, and, and other companies who are tasked with being the official vetter of this information. And so what you see in some tools is the ability to recognize um, tags or descriptions as official or, or vetted or, or some other you know, or colored differently, but you can say, okay, well, that's the like authoritative view on this particular data set or this particular column. Um, meanwhile, here's what other people have to say about it. Um, and, and being able to distinguish between what is uh, a curated or vetted representation of that metadata versus what sort of, uh, you know, generally crowdsourced and unvetted. I think both are really important, but you, you have the, the a specific role associated with that that generally sits in the business but is closer in, to IT and bridges IT um, on behalf of the business users. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think you brought a good point. We've talked so much about tool, that whole idea of governance and how we establish governance in those right roles. And I think as different as every company is how different that governance model works. So is it a formal steering committee and or is it data stewards? And I think they, they have a place of living together. I, I often see, you know, there is a data steward. They may be a technical steward and a business steward, you know, depending on the different roles. I think that steering committee often is a nice way for when there's sort of, um, you know, differences of opinion or the, the arbitrator or <laughs> whatever between. I think that sort of offers the, the enterprise view. But I think you're right. And often, you know, what I've found, a lot of folks, when we start to talk about governance, they say, oh, isn't that an extra layer? Isn't that an extra? Well, 
doing it without governance, we, we see the mass, right? But often these data stewards, they probably exist already, right? The, the people that, oh, go to, you know, in the old days, it was go to Joe, he knows, right? Well, do we give now go, Joe the formal role with some accountability and some voice? And I, I've often seen people jump right into these roles because it's, in a way, relief. Thank you. I now have a place to share either the issues or, or the knowledge that I have. So, yeah, or other folks, I would, I would assume, kind of having some idea of this data stewardship and... Uh, and and um, go, uh, what do you call it? Governance committees, and I think that 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 is getting that right is as hard as getting the tool right. I think. Well, wow. so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, someone else kind of mentioned some of the volume, right? <laughs> and I I think that's you know someone you know we've nine thousand attributes. We're not going to put all of that into the glossary. And I I think that's where and I, that's a place where your CDM or the that kind of prioritization can help. Let, let's fix that. Back to your canonical model there, the canonical you know, view, Kelly. What, what are the core things we need to focus on and kind of let some of the other things uh, going? Uh, well, again, kind of back to crowdsourcing is you let people decide what's important. Not all data sets are equally valuable or important to the business. And even down in a particular data set, not all fields are essential uh, in all cases. So letting people uh, describe and annotate things helps you understand um, what things are valuable. Another thing that we see, um, uh, for example, in, in, uh, in Dremio, and this is true of other tools as well, is you can start to get a sense for the popularity of data sets based on how frequently they're accessed, and in, in a sense get a heat map of, of data across all the different systems and down to the column level to understand, hey, these are the data sets people keep using over and over again. What if it's the wrong data set? <laughs> what if yeah. you need to redirect people to, hey, that's, that's the outdated copy. You need to be using this newer copy right. or, um, or, or other sorts of interesting patterns that are really hard to understand if you have, you know, 10 different BI tools and 100 different data sources. How do you know what people are querying and accessing? Um, some of these newer technologies give you a sense for that um, and let you quickly understand where there is uh, ongoing interest in, the, like I said, kind of a heat map of where things are going on. I think that's a great way of that overlap we were talking of the, the sort of when things are locked down and, you know, that encyclopedia versus Wikipedia to keep using that, that example. But, you know, it could be that, you know, in many cases, some of that prioritization is done from the top down. You know, the CEO is, has a customer centricity mantra and we're, we're changing from a product center to a customer centric model. We want to focus on customer data. You know, that we need a customer master. That's all well and good, and we have a customer master. You could, from what your you know, you, your great example of maybe we've published customer master, but but nobody knows it's there, and everyone's going to the old version, right? It could be that people aren't using the standards, and or it could be that in our customer master we've decided these are the ten most valuable fields, and when we look at the usage, people say no, these other six are really valuable as well. So maybe that's that kind of you know feedback of when we have the kind of vetted master, we can listen to the voice of the people. I think it's a mix, you know, some things are locked down and but also have that open voice. You know, you don't want chaos with everyone just chiming in. This is customer data, right? But I think it's that, that feedback loop of, of which data is uh, allowed to be, kind of, you know, some of the queries and then allowed that crowdsourcing view and then kind of that idea you had of color coding, right? <laughs> no, this is social security number. We don't get to choose whether this is visible or not. <laughs> you know, there's laws around that one. Right, right. Yeah. So I think that's great. Just quickly, because I have to answer it because it's near and dear to my heart. Someone mentioned uh, about the conceptual data model and what level of detail I would say this is a great place. Just don't don't over detail it for the someone that had a bad experience. This is these are those core terms. What is a customer? How is that different from a prospect? How is that different from a patient or a member, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I think starting small with a piece of the business that where where you know there's a pain point. Sales and marketing and finance can't agree with how we handle mem uh, you know uh, you know customers versus prospects get that hashed out and, and just keep it very simple. I often don't even show attributes, just definitions and boxes and, and those, those, that cardinality between them uh, could be a great way to kind of hash out some of these core issues. And it can also help identify what some of that core data that needs to be curated and what can be sort of opened up for crowdsourcing. Great. Um, we are getting close on time. So um, I, I think this has been a great discussion and I think partly because this is, I, there's no one answer, right? I think. I think the beauty of the tools and the different ways of governing in this world um, is that there's, I think it's an and, it's not an or. I think things like um, master data are still super valuable. I think these crowdsourcing and, and uh, you know, 
open source and uh, self-service is a great way to evolve. And I think that idea of the collaboration, getting that right of what those right roles and right stewardship is really key to that success. And to double check, um, I'm on slide 20. Is that what you're seeing as well, Kelly? Um, uh, yes. I think so. All right. I don't see a slide number on this one. Yeah, slide 20. Okay. Um, just to remind folks uh, that for next year we do have the series. We'll be starting again on uh, data architecture strategies and, and so what are the next big things to think about. Maybe it's self-service. I think there's been a lot of discussion there, right? What are some of these new tools that people can use to really make this doable? Um, there is a white paper that we mentioned on the trends in data architecture, which is available if you want more details on any of those uh, figures we mentioned. Um, um, I am from Global Data Strategy. We do this for a living. If you need consulting help, and Dremio is our sponsor uh, for some of the tools. Um, there'll be uh, Shannon will send out some more information on that particular tool because I know there were some questions about that as well. Um, so Shannon, I'm going to pass it over to you to wrap it up, or if you wanted to take any additional questions before we go. I don't see Shannon on, Donna. That is that is odd. I know I know this. Uh, I I wasn't bored. She maybe she was so bored she left. Um, <laughs> there will be a Shannon on the call, but not our Shannon. Ah, uh, is Tenley still on the call? Because someone was asking about the polling slide. I'm wondering if you could bring that up for us. Which slide is that? Going the polling. Nope. Yeah, we weren't able to get the final poll. It's not a slide. It's um. Is it slide 21? No. All right. So unfortunately, we're not able to show the poll um, unless there was any other final Q&A. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, and as usual, uh, Shannon will send out the, the slides, because that's always the first question we have. Will these slides be available? Uh, they will, will. We'll ask Shannon to put in the results of the poll, because we're all curious. <laughs> um, and expect that within the next three to five business days. So thanks all uh, for joining, and we hope to see you again in January. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. No.